Hey guys, how's it going? It's Alex Williamson here with The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. And we have some really cool little fish here. Uh, they're a, a nano species or near nano species. In theory, the males can uh, reach only about an inch and a half. The females could reach two inches, but they tend to stay a little smaller than that. So we've got some in a bag here because they're so fun that I ordered more. But let me show you them in their uh, in their uh, relaxed state and talk about a little bit about care and where they come from and their natural history and biology. So these guys are called Pethia uh, gallus or galeus, and they are known as the golden dwarf barb. They're a really pretty peaceful fish. And if anything, they actually can get out-competed because they're a little bit shy. But let's take these fish over to the tank where the others have already acclimated and talk a little bit more about them. And you can see them in their full color underneath the, the light in that tank. All right, guys, so these are kind of a timid little fish, but if you have enough other nano fish with them or small size fish, they do really well. So in here you can see we've got some of the purple rasboras uh, and some of the glow lights. These are the purple glow lights and then the normal glow lights. Then that is a baby uh, wild beta maculatus. And then in here there are lots of Malawa shrimp from the island of uh, Sulawesi uh, in Indonesia. And these shrimp reproduce at a really fast rate in most tanks, most freshwater tanks that are slightly acidic. And so they're all over the tank. But it makes for an awesome food source for this cool fish. And uh, when they eat live food, be it Daphnia, you can see they're actually hunting little seed shrimp or water uh, fleas or something in there. They're definitely an interesting fish, but they utilize every layer of the tank. You can see some are at the top and they'll hunt those little white uh, bugs that hop on top of the water, the little springtails or water fleas, whatever you want to call them. And they'll also go all the way down into the bottom areas of the tank and they'll spread out. They don't always hang out in a little uh, school, but if they're nervous, they will actually kind of school up or shoal up, which is fun. Now, the more planted your tank is and the more hiding spots that they have, the less that they will hide. And I know that's kind of confusing to a lot of people, but I've done entire... And I know it's kind of confusing to folks uh, that the more plants you have, the more hiding spots you have, the less a fish will hide. But it's really true in that they feel safe when they've got all this area when we pull out and look at the whole tank they've got all this area to go hide in to get away from me if, if I'm making them nervous and so they get a lot bolder and do come out into that open space that is available and that's really true with a lot of nano fish that are very peaceful fish uh, and these ones have been known for quite some time. Uh, first documented by Western explorers uh, by a guy at the name of Hamilton, and he documented them all the way back in 1880s and formally submitted them as a new species in 1890 after he was done staying in India and Pakistan area um, which was all formerly uh, the Indian colony or uh, part of the British Empire at the time. So he found these in um, the Ganges River Basin and then later it was discovered that these fish are actually very widespread. They're found all the way from the border of Afghanistan and uh, Iran two different areas of Pakistan, all the way through, you know, Kashmir and the Himalayan foothills, and then all the way down through um, different parts of India and into Bangladesh. And there are three species of uh, the Pethias uh, in the genus 
uh, Pethia that are very, very similar. Now these ones, um, the Galeus or Gileus, it's an actual um, tribal name by one of the groups that lived in the area for uh, for the fish, and so they named them after that. The, the guy came back from the trip with more than enough fish to name <laughs> after all his friends, and so these were uh, of least concern, I suppose, at the time, and so he didn't really worry about uh, them getting some grand name after some duke or naturalist at the time that was all the rage. But they're a really beautiful little fish, and they move around with, with quite a bit of intention. And I mean that by their eyes are ocular, um, they, they pivot on a little ball kind of uh, motion, and that, that means they can kind of, you can see where their eyes are going to turn and look, kind of like a little puffer. And they actually inhabit uh, all the way down to the Malbar region as well, which is where pea puffers are from. And so it's kind of interesting that they've got this kind of bumblebee striping. Um, and they come from waters that are muddy river waters all the way into the seasonal floodplains because the monsoon in, it reaches most of the range they live in. And they tend to really like the waters where it's flooded out and it's actually um, farmland or rice paddy gr um, growing areas and in that grassy area where there's crops growing or there's rice paddies growing in the ponds and things when they fill up all the way uh, with water then they move in and uh, they eat all the little bugs and in insects and critters that are in the shallows and they like to also spawn during that time so they're a seasonal spawner but you can get them to spawn pretty much any time in captivity they're egg scatterers and they will eat their babies because uh, they're fish that aren't cichlids <laughs> you know most fish do tend to eat their babies uh, if, if given the chance but what happens is they'll lay eggs and within not even two days, less than two days, the eggs will hatch. And so uh, then the, within three or four days, they'll be free swimming. Uh, their yolk sacs will have absorbed and they will be swimming around, usually in the shallowest water possible with the most plants and reeds and things possible. If you can get a lot of, um, you know, different uh, nodja grass or hornwort or something that floats, water lettuce, duckweed, anything that's where they're probably going to hide the babies and they'll hang out in the corners of your tank or there or before that stage they'll hang out really low and hiding in any brush you have so they're very prone to getting eaten so you kind of need to specifically want to breed these and pull the parents out if if your goal is to uh really get a good number of them bred but they are known to breed a little bit in the tank with other fish um, you know if the babies can survive now they're also found in the region with the scarlet baddis uh, as well as a few other uh, of the baddis like baddis baddis um, and they're found with uh, not too far actually from uh, the water conditions where like panda loaches are found also those are found in China and it's over the Himalayas which is no small feat but the the, the ecosystems are pretty similar um, where they can get fairly cold in the winter but uh, they like warm water and they hang out in the shallow warm water uh, m most of the year they're in warm conditions it's just it can get cold so they are somewhat tolerant to uh, temperature swings but they tend to kind of follow the seasons and you know stay in shallow waters where the sun is heating it um, when it's colder out and it, and then uh, in the warmer waters that are flood waters or monsoon waters uh, when they can have that option as well now as for water conditions I just decided to feed them before I talk about water conditions but as for water conditions, they like uh, acidic water to neutral water. The water is closer to neutral when it first comes down during the rainy season, but then it will spike 
in acidity uh, due to leaves and plant material floating in the water um, and floating in the areas that were f that were previously on land uh, and it tends to get kind of muddy and also it can get quite turbid as these flash floods kind of start happening and uh, the fish get all excited and ready to start spreading out so in the dry season they're living in warm stagnant waters that are kind of muddy or maybe right on the edge of a river uh, and then when the rain comes the water drops a good 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit if not more uh, three or four Celsius possibly and from that 78 to 84 degree range that they live in in their summer months or their dry months rather they then go into the rainy season or monsoon season and they get triggered to spawn so it's that water flowing in that has a low TDS and more neutral water rather than acidic water that really triggers them into spawning so they have big water change feeding them live food or high protein food uh, will really get them in shape for breeding and as far as breeding goes you can tell the males from the females because the males uh, on their anal fin they've got a little bit of red uh, on their anal fin uh, when they're coloring up for spawning so you may need to get a group and then take a look at them closely but right after the black dot on that anal fin before the tail you'll see a light reddish hue in a lot of them. Uh, sometimes it's in the caudal peduncle and in the pectoral or dorsal fin also. You can actually see a little bit of orange right there. On It's just like an iridescent orange uh, on its pectoral fins right now. But that that's one way to tell. And then obviously the females will swell up with a big round belly. And you can either split them up like this one here, um, you could you could split them up, and so you could keep the males and females separate and condition them for breeding. So wait until their belly, the silver area of their belly, gets nice and round, and then put them together with a male, one on one. Or you can just put you know five or six random fish together. Um, after feeding them a high protein diet for two or three weeks and the cool thing about these fish is you can season them uh, and condition them into spawning obviously but you can also just feed them flake food like I just did here um, I don't know if you guys saw it but you can catch a glimpse just then too of that reddening on the uh, on the pectoral and anal fin there this one doesn't seem to have it at all this might be a female here so they come in a lot of different color forms also and they're pretty uh, acrobatic fish like you just maybe you just caught some of that but uh, some of them have kind of more of a rusty rusty red color and uh, kind of more like those ember tetras and some of them are more bright yellow and after they've been in captivity a while and not eating whatever it is they eat in the wild, probably a lot of insects with organic uh, iodines and uh, other compounds in them, omega-3s and omega-6s, uh, fatty acids, that's what gives them the vivid colors. Uh, but you can still see, even in captivity, they have a really nice iridescence and just like a beautiful color. They're just really cool uh, fish to watch. They're really like a bumblebee with that yellow it almost has a little slight bit of green in it in these ones but some are more of like a bronze and red like I was saying and some are more of this kind of yellowish green color that one there you can catch a little bit of the orange on the midsection a little bit of the redder uh, yellow uh, but it kind of changes with their mood too so right now they're eating the flake food but before I added the food they were hunting all these little shrimp and so it gives them a good excuse and a nice little hunting exercise, uh, gets their instincts going. And when they have the babies, uh, the babies will need to eat infusoria for the first 
uh, few weeks. So the first two to four weeks, they'll only be able to eat like paramecium or single cell uh, or very simple creatures. But after that time, uh, they'll be able to eat Daphnia or baby brine shrimp, uh, mosquito larva, whatever it is uh, that you want to feed them. If it's live, that's better. Um, the instincts really kick in and also they tend to have far more babies as do most little nano fish when there is an abundance of food in the tank while they're getting ready to breed so if they sense that there's enough food for their babies that's when uh, they're gonna have a lot more eggs plus it's high protein for the parents so uh, they're a really fun little fish and they're a really peaceful little fish that doesn't get much bigger than the size you see right here. So they're a great little community fish if you have a nano tank or peaceful fish. I wouldn't keep them with like uh, too many other barbs or uh, you know even like cherry barbs might be okay uh, but most barbs are a little rambunctious for them and so it's good to keep them with you know shy tetras or rasboras or danios I wouldn't keep them with uh, with leopard danios or zebra danios because they're just too rambunctious and they'll overpower them for food. But when they are allowed to shine on their own, they are quite the cool little fish and they move around a lot. They're a lot of fun and uh, I've really enjoyed them just in the time that I've had them. Uh, and apparently they've been in the hobby for quite some time as well. So that is the rundown on these fish, uh, and I hope that you guys will think about checking them out, and uh, let me know if you've kept these fish, if you like them, and uh, if there's any quirks or uh, interesting facts you've picked up about these fish, because uh, I'm kind of enamored with them at the moment. Thanks for watching, guys, and I will talk to you later, next time on The Secret History of Living in Your Aquarium. And uh, if you enjoy this content, please hit that like button. It really does help the news travel when videos are out. And, uh, you know, share it with a friend if you think these fish would be right for them. Or uh, subscribe if you'd like to see the next species profile uh, that I have coming out every week or two. And historic video every uh, week or two as well. I do two videos a week and two live streams a week at least. So... All right, guys, take it easy, have a good one, and I will talk to you later. Bye, guys.